Welcome to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about neuroscience, how to use neuroscience to stop drinking alcohol in particular. And I am joined by a Brit by the name of Dr. Rob Kelly, who goes by Dr. Rob. And he is from the north of England in Manchester, but is currently based in San Antonio, Texas. And he is known as a recovery coach and uh, a renowned addiction expert. Uh, he's been on the Doctor's TV show amongst uh, other US media programs, and he has a very unique and unconventional approach to what is known as addiction. Uh, here at Alcohol Free Lifestyle, we also like to think that we have an unconventional and unique approach. So I'm thrilled to have Dr. Rob Kelly on the show with us today. Dr. Rob, great to have you with us, sir. Good to be here, James. It's going to be a, an amazing show, you can bet. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about you and your way or your path to helping people. Well, I'm, I, I used to suffer from alcoholism and drug addiction, um, and uh, nobody knew or could help me back in the late 80s. So I kind of lost everything, wife, kids, cars, houses, and become homeless. And nobody had any pointers or anything. They got to go to 12-step meetings, that, and that's fine. But uh, I stayed sick for a long time because there was no knowledge about alcoholism or addiction back in the day. So when I finally got off the streets, I decided to spend the rest of my life finding out what's going on in their head, because there was something going on where, you know, I put alcohol before my children, before my wife, and on two occasions I died. So before my life, um, so I knew it wasn't a choice. The choice had been taken away. I just knew that because of what I personally been through. So I spent the last 25 years delving into the neuroscience, uh, study the mind, the brain, the subconscious mind, and find out exactly what's going on. And, and the results were astonishing. Uh, we all say this, you know, alcohol has 1% to do with alcoholism. Everybody thinks if I can just stop drinking, everything will be fine. And that's not the case. It's far from the case. And the other thing we studied over the years was, you know, people throw the alcoholic tag around, or Jimmy around the corner drinks every day is an alcoholic. That's not true. Alcoholism is the only self-diagnosed illness in the world. 10 DUIs do not make you an alcoholic and stuff like that. So that's what we do today. Five offices around the world. We're a multi-million dollar company and uh, we get people well and bring families together. That's the other big thing, the families. People seem to miss out on this journey. I was surprised recently to learn that the term alcoholic and alcoholism is no longer used in the medical community. In fact, alcohol use disorder is now the terminology that's used. And to your point, I think, when you said that alcoholism is the only self-diagnosed, uh, what, self-diagnosed what? What's the word after that? Self-diagnosed illness? Illness, or yes. Illness, yeah. Um, is that your understanding as well? Like, like just to maybe explain, because in my view, the way I read that, there are millions of people mistakenly walking around the world calling themselves an alcoholic when maybe they just have a temporary challenge with alcohol and they're not actually an alcoholic. So you need to talk to that point. Through my travels around the world, I used to speak on behalf of AA and loved it. But what I found with the meetings I've been to over the last 30 years, uh, I could make this bold statement. 90% of people that are in an AA room, any one time, anywhere in the world, are not the real alcoholic. They've been sent there by the judge. They've been sent there by the wife or the friends or whatever it is have been sent there. And what happens is those guys can go to the first meeting and never drink again. If you can go to a meeting and sit around with a bunch of guys and never drink again without looking at the book or doing the work, you are not an alcoholic, guys. And this is a sole point of mine because we we get non-alcoholics. And, and of course, the only, I think it is the only desire, something to stop drinking, you can come in. That's fine. But the, the lack of information inside them rooms is is crazy. So when we found out that alcoholics are born and drug addicts are made, that kind of freaked everybody out. You know, so we've changed the. I've stopped going to AA like four four years ago because the book is amazing. The book is way before its time, but the people in there are just you know I, I can't deal with them anymore. 
So, you know, it's just the understanding of what alcoholism really is. Because if me and you right now, James, went on the streets with a microphone and we ask 100 people what's alcoholism, 99.9% of them are going to say somebody who drinks too much alcohol. That's not the case. That's far from the case. So the misunderstanding is where we are. And the misunderstanding of the disease is what's causing thousands and thousands of people a week to die of this disease. And it is a disease. And we'll, and we'll get to that shortly. You know, but uh, yeah, it's just lack of knowledge. Mm. Do you yourself use now alcohol use disorder in terms of when you're talking about it? Or have you, if not, what do you use? What's the phraseology that you use? Well, we have a, obviously the mental uh, wellness coming from the mental uh, illness. So I think everybody wants to fly around the alcoholic tag, but once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic does not mean that you tag yourself and you introduce yourself all the time. It just means that three parts of your brain differ from any other human being alive. And that then three parts of the brain reset every 24 hours. See, 24 hours of time is not an AA thing. It goes way before that when, you know, the early guys that study the mind find out that it reset every 24 hours. And the reason why it resets most of the time is the lack of oxygen during the sleep. So if you want, if you want, to, st if you want to make the subconscious mind rule your day, lack of oxygen, is it? So straight out of sleep, nobody's ever woke up laughing. Reason? No oxygen. So we're at our lowest. So the subconscious brain is, boo, it wakes us up in the morning. Unless we get rid of that and ignite the conscious brain, then you're going to have a bad day and probably relapse. You said that you had discovered some amazing things using neuroscience. Would you walk us through some of the most profound things that you've discovered in your neuroscience research as it relates yeah, to alcohol? Of course. So alcoholics are born and people get freaked out when I say that, but bear with me. Um, our trials and tests have, have proven um, there is a generational pass down uh, hereditary with alcoholism. There's a gene that's gets passed down from family to family now, uh, generation, generation, sorry. Now it may skip one or two generations, but it's there. That's the main thing. So why are we born this way? Well, the predisposition and the allergic reaction to ethanol is what we found. The amygdala, the basal ganglia, and the hypothalamus are the key players with any alcoholic. So the hypothalamus, let's say, it's our survival. It tells us how to keep alive. And the, the basic message is you have to drink water and eat food to survive. From birth, we know that. We know that to be true. So automatically, the, the, the hypothalamus is, you know, we've got to eat, we've got to drink, that's it, finished. When we, in the alcoholic, it differs. So when, we, when alcoholics drink alcohol, over a period of time, what happens with the hypothalamus is it turns around and stops telling us to drink water and eat food, and it directly tells the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain, I need to drink alcohol to keep alive. And that is it. And that's why I could go days or weeks without food or water, because my survival part of the brain is going, hey, you need to drink this to survive. And when, when, when I explain that, alcoholics go, oh, my goodness, that, that is true. Because any normal brain would not put a, a, a alcohol before a baby, alcohol before children, alcohol before. The, they, we wouldn't do that. So I knew there was something special that was happening that nobody else knew about. So that, that's the biggest eye opener. And of course, neuroplasticity is also uh, was a big opener for us because we can reprogram neuropathways. What we also found is around 300 neuropathways die each day in the in the brain. What are we what are we replacing them with? So if you're replacing them with yesterday's habits, one of the worst things I hate in the saying is is from a 12 step room is if we do the same today as we did yesterday, we'll stay sober. That's not true. That is far from the truth. People who stay the same, they stagnate. Alcoholics who stagnate, they drink and die. So we have to be moving forward every single day. So what am I replacing them 300 neural pathways with that they're going to be good, they're going to be positive. And the realization, the way the mind and the brain work is I literally can achieve anything I want to achieve. And people say, well, that's not possible. Oh, that's your childhood trauma, which is the gateway drug, by the way. Somebody's put that there. I mean, forget your political views, guys, for a second, okay? We had a business 
running the country for four years with no political experience whatsoever. Don't dare tell me that you can't achieve your dreams. It's just not true. Yeah. When you were referring to the hereditary passing down of the gene, um, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism says that if your parents or grandparents had an alcohol use disorder, they estimate you have a 50% increased likelihood of having an alcohol use disorder. That's how they present it. Um, and what we say in our alcohol free lifestyle is that that may be the case, like it may not be your fault that you have a 50% increase likelihood of having it. But now it now is your responsibility to do something about it. And our argument certainly is with what they call epigenetics, changing your lifestyle, changing your environment, changing the people you're around, making good nutritional choices, getting sunlight, focusing on sleep optimization, living a life of appreciation instead of expectation, getting rid of certain products from your kitchen and bathroom, which are filled with parabens and chemicals. Uh, getting into an environment where you're almost forced to be outside in nature a lot more, you actually can change your genetic expression. My understanding is that you cannot change your genetic code or your genetic sequence, but you can change the expression of your genes and therefore diffuse the likelihood of having an alcohol use disorder. Is that your understanding based on your neuroscience and, and habits? research? 100%. You know, again, people want to say, oh, it's alcohol. It's not alcohol, guys. It's our diet. It's the food we eat. It's the environment. So I love what you just said there, James, that it's not your fault that you got it, but it's your fault that you're staying there. We said to people, everything comes from childhood trauma, not the childhood trauma that people know, talk about stuff. It goes way, way deeper than that. But if you've been molested as a child and you're carrying that into your 30s and 40s and 50s, then shame on you. Again, not your fault, but what is your fault? And I say this in the nicest, kindest possible way is not getting some kind of therapy for that. Because unless you've got brain damage, severe brain damage, you can get over everything you've been through. Everything that's, that's been said, done, felt, hair, touch is stored in the subconscious brain. And one of the reasons why people self-sabotage is as children, we're told by mom, don't put your hand on the stove, it'll burn you. We put our hand on the stove and it burns us. We, so what, what message does that give us? It gives us that mom knows the truth. So therefore, everyone else that's telling me stuff knows the truth. As we go up through life, we realize that's not right. But 1% of that subconscious mind will hear something and you'll take it and it'll store it there. 999 people. You are amazing tonight, James. You are fantastic. One person, I think you were terrible. You were too loud. You're too aggressive. Who am I concentrating on for the next couple of weeks? That one guy, that one guy. So we have to get treatment. Everybody has childhood trauma. Alcoholics and addicts are more sensitive to trauma. You know, me and my brother stood on the kitchen table. My mother, it's a true story. My mother walked in and she said, get down off that table, you stupid idiots. Get down before your dad gets home. My brother jumps down and I freeze. Why do I freeze? Because this is what I've heard. Get out of that table, you stupid idiot. That's what I hear. Partially because of my alcoholism and partially because how I hear things around me, I believe to be true and more aggressive because I'm more sensitive than my brother is. So you have to take, like, it's like when somebody goes to uh, doctors, uh, knowing the serotonin is low, but not asking why it's slow, but we go to the doctors, he puts us on some depressed meds and now we, we kind of feel okay. It's like, why aren't we asking the question before we go? Okay. Why are we not looking at our food sources? Why are we looking, why are we telling granny to stay inside and turn the fire up? Sitting down will kill you. And I know I'm bouncing there guys, but listen, there's four oils that we need in life. You go to the supermarket, you spin it round, and we found all of this affects addiction. You find out how many rancid oils are in there, the sunflower oil. and You find out how much sugar. And it, and it might say, like, I got a bar off the shelf that is nine grams of protein and zero sugar. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is great. When I look through the 27 ingredients there, and of the 27, 11, most human beings can't methylate. 
So when there's a uh, when we can't methylate, it becomes an absence deficiency, and then that causes the illness. And and three of them are not meant for human consumption. And this all ties into addiction. What do we need? Coconut oil, grass-fed butter, olive oil, avocado. That is it, guys. That's it. The rest of the stuff comes right back from Rockefeller, convincing everybody that oil was good to cook in. Yes. Yes. I actually cook it with ghee. G-H-E. Yeah, yeah, ghee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I was um I was just I'm looking through to my kitchen right now from where I'm recording this, and I'll tell you what I see, and you can put it through the test if you like and tell me whether you think this is a tick or a or a red cross. I've got uh, a dozen pasture raised eggs. Yeah. I've got ghee. Uh, I've got electrolytes. I've got Himalayan salt. Uh, what else do I see? Uh, I've got two supplements there, or three supplements, I should say. I've got vitamin C, zinc, and then I've got a whey protein powder, which I have one, once a week. So that's what I'm seeing. And then in my refrigerator currently i have kefir um which is uh as as i understand a great source of probiotics uh, so that's what i see and that's what i got in my fridge and then at night time for dinner i'll have grass-fed steak or chicken or i'll have wild uh fish as opposed to farm-raised salmon that you usually get uh and then i also i, I i'm a bit i'm mistaken i also see pumpkin seeds which i snack on What's your view on what I just outlined? That's the perfect diet. You know, when you look at that kind of diet and stuff you eat and you realize, I, you, I, I don't know how old you are, but you can bet you don't look your age. Your mind is, is sharp. You know, the behavioral science is perfect. The, the psychological is perfect because we're eating that. But people don't do that and, the, and they think they can get away with it and they can't. It's really important what we put into our body because as far as addiction is concerned, if we're on sugar every single day, you look at the back of this, this and, and they disguise it in different words, guys. You know, uh, just look for GMO and syrup stairs, and that. you'll find out that normal can of Coke has nine spoonfuls of sugar in, and Diet Coke has 8.7 spoonfuls of sugar in. So don't be fooled by the diet thing on the front of the cola. Worst thing a human being can put in the body. Absolutely. So when you look at the food and oxygen, that is every look at the food first of all, most important thing. And I always tell people, I'm not asking you to run out tomorrow and go all vegan and gluten free and spend a fortune. What I'm saying is try one day a week with the diet and the food that you've just the staple that you've just mentioned, James. Just try it once a week. And I guarantee you, for a day or two after, you're gonna feel amazing. But we don't do it. And the other thing is, well, is oxygen. You know, the presence of oxygen equals the lack of disease. That is the statement I would carry through to the rest of my life from my good friend and associate Gary Brecker. We, every illness, every disease, every cancer, every growth created in the body starts in a hypoxic area of the body. So if you've got your diet right, you've got your uh, breath continuously going every single day, uh, you're on for an amazing day. Because when we do the breath work in the morning, you kill that subconscious brain. And that's what it's about. You've got to look at lifestyle as a whole. If you're sitting down for eight hours a day in the office, you know, you need to walk around more. You need to get up. Everyone who sits down is taking like six months off their life every single day. I'm convinced of it. That's not a scientific fact, but I'm convinced of it. You know, going home and sitting in front of the TV all night. I mean, it's just we're meant to move around. Human beings are meant to move around. You know, but we don't anymore because everything's on the phone or everything's on the PC or gaming. Show me a guy, show me a kid that's gaming six hours a day. I'll show you a future addict. Period. Yeah. On the movement uh, piece of it, I I always try to get at least 10,000 steps a day in and I track it with my aura ring, which I'm wearing now. And that's in addition to a gym workout where I'm lifting weights. So, for example, uh, I'll just share this anecdote because I I would submit that it would be helpful for many of our listeners. Uh, Yesterday was one of those unique days where it'd be about 3.34 in the afternoon and I still hadn't walked anywhere except upstairs to go to go to the gym. And the easy thing to do would have been to just go, oh, okay, I just missed it. But I intentionally then said, okay, time to go and get my 10,000 steps. And I deliberately walked uh, for about 
uh, 6,000 steps. I came back and then later on, instead of making a meal at home in my, in my home last night, knowing that I was still 4,000 steps short of the 10,000, I decided to walk to a restaurant that I know where I ordered grass fed, uh, steak, 450 grams of grass fed steak and some grilled vegetables, uh, and then walked home. And then I got to about 9,800 steps. And then just walking around my home last night was enough to get me over the 10,000. So people might go, geez, that's a bit over-optimized, isn't it? I would submit no, because, you know, it was a rare day. I was at home, st stuck inside until 3.34. And then I intentionally decided to get up and move around and get those 10,000 steps in. And I'll also say this in addition, there's a great book called Get Up by James Levine. And in that book, he actually revealed that we can halve our blood sugar levels or our blood glucose levels by simply getting up and moving within five minutes of having the last bite of food. So a lot of people, when they're eating meals, they'll eat, have a big heavy meal and they'll just sit there or they'll go to the couch and they'll sit there. And of course that then the body starts to store fat. It's not metabolizing yeah. the food as well. Whereas he submitted in his book, get up that if you just get up and walk for 15 minutes, just a 10, 15 minute walk immediately after the last bite of food, you can halve your, your blood glucose levels. Any thoughts on any of that, Dr. Rob? 100%. Yeah, definitely. If you look at what, what, what strips fat most is the liver. So we look at the liver, um, where, where the, the liver takes, takes the fat and can also disperse fat, but you gotta be taking that methionine and acetone and stuff like that. But anything that's, that's uh, done movement wise after any meal exactly or half it, but that's not general knowledge. That's what makes me feel sad about the United States of America and England and probably Canada and Australia is that is not common. Why is that not con uh, common knowledge? You know? So if, if, if I was to, the asked the question is how do I get healthy tomorrow, Rob? The answer would be get that, get the method, uh, methylation gene, get the MTHFR gene, get tested for that, find out what you're deficient in, and then follow instructions. I mean, the government as a whole is not really bothered. Uh, when you get a health minister, I forget what, what state it's in, but the way in 310 pounds, you know, there's something wrong. Um, so somebody asked me once, you know, about um, um, ob obesity and stuff like that. And, you know, it's out of control today. It really is out of control. Obesity that we look at. So we've got to be careful. I mean, and this, this knowledge needs to become general knowledge. If you, if you look at the diabetes website on the main page and you followed everything on that main page, you would get diabetes. You you're look. talking about the U.S. government, yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, recommendations, yes, consume to yes. avoid diabetes. You're submitting you would get diabetes. Yes, just yeah, go and have I a look after we've done this. I would love to pull it up now, and we'll we'll have a look at it, and I'll ask you a question while you're pulling it up, if you like. Um, I, have I haven't got the uh, thing to pull it up right now. No, I've no got, problems I'm, at all. I'm on my giant screen. No, no worries at all. Um, I'm in alignment with you on what you shared there. In fact, mm. uh, it's coming out now increasingly so that the, the the food pyramid that the US government suggested for years was completely wrong, inverted, and is probably responsible for more public health crises in the, in the United States today than anything combined. And yet people, are, in my view, are just looking at the wrong things, like they're focused on all the wrong yeah. things. Uh, and this obsession with eating grains and wheats and breads and all this guy, it's absolutely preposterous. It is, you know, we think it's the norm as well. You know, I get, I often get calls from mothers whose young kids uh, are acting up at school, can't keep still at the back. They've been put at the back of the class, da, 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 da. And I always ask them one question and, and James, you'll be aghast at the answer because it's always the same. Well, we get up in the morning and we, you know, have breakfast cereal. What do you have? Well, Lucky Charms. Okay. Banned in every other, every other country available apart from the US. What else do you give them? I give them a pop tart on the way out. Okay. So you've loaded this kid with bad crap and sugar. Okay. And then you send him off to school and expect him to sit there all day long listening to the teachers. It's not going to happen. 
you know, it's like the oatmeal and the porridge. You, what? That they're for yes. horses. Why? Why are we eating that? It's just cardboard. It doesn't do anything for us. Eggs are bad for you, and all this crap that comes out. It's just this. This week it's don't eat this, then it's don't eat that. I mean, it's just find get knowledgeable about what your body needs. Get knowledgeable about what you can methylate and what you can't methylate. Period. And your life not only be extended, but the the brain will act fifty percent than it is now. The fatigue will drop by 50%. Everything will become clearer and you will be happier. So there's four chemicals in the brain that need to happen every day. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. We need them chemicals every day in the brain. Okay, that's easy. Got them, four. Not many people know that dopamine and serotonin is created in the gut. So unless you're eating properly, or almost properly, then two chemicals are not going to be created and you're always going to be depressed. Everybody I see outside what we do and we've treated are probably around 40 to 60% of their capability and capacity in this world. Mm. The guys that know what's going on, they're up there 90 to 100. Mm. They're the guys running Apple and, and, and all that stuff. They're, they're switched on. It's like, you know, I, I, I only deal with A-list celebrities right now. My staff, you know, we, we deal with everybody. But the Rolling Stones is a fine example. Oh, they drink, they smoke. Da, da, da. If you think at the age of 80-something that they're drinking copious amounts of alcohol and, and eating McDonald's every night, you've got to be insane with that thinking. They are so good at what they eat. They very rarely drink. Three of them have been sober for years and years and years, but they carry this image on. goes back to the food source. And if you trace your food source back, most of it you'll be shocked at. Mm. I had a, uh, a guest on the, the podcast recently by the name of Julia Ross. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but she's written some books called The Diet Cure, The Mood Cure, and The Craving Cure. And she uh, has worked in the recovery space for 30 years. Mm. I used to run rehab, um, as consulted to the rehab centers, etc. And she put forward five amino acids that, in her view, if we humans just concentrated on getting those amino acids into us, we could actually destroy all of our cravings for alcohol. So let me put them to you right now, Dr. Robin. Maybe you could tell me what you feel about them. She said tyrosine was the first one, uh, helps the neurotransmitters for focus. The second one was GABA, uh, obviously helps calm and, and relax people. The third was DPA or DLPA, um, which helps to retain natural endorphin levels. The fourth one was glutamine, which supplies glucose to the brain trans, uh, neurotransmitters. And the last one was tryptophan or uh, otherwise known as 5-HTP, which helps serotonin levels. And her view was if we uh, supplemented with those in addition to eating animal protein, like clean grass, grass fed or wild animal mm -hmm. protein, then we would destroy most, if not all cravings. What's your view on that? I would imagine that was true, but I've not done any research on that, so I can't give you a clinical answer to that. But it, it sounds right. You know, it really does. It sounds right. I don't know. I mean, when you go to alcoholism, again, you've got to understand what we're dealing with. And for, for, it's like the, the drugs out, stop you drinking now. They, you know, I can't think of a name right now, but, they, you know, take this and you take the cravings off. That's amazing for people who have, who have uh, alcohol abuse problems or heavy drinkers, you know, and stuff like that. But for the real, the real alcoholic, just to split the both up uh, that kind of stuff doesn't work now does it help of course it does of course it helps but there's a different a different idea going on with with alcoholism that again nobody really understands and that is alcohol well first of all you can't crave for anything that's not been in the body for 24 hours people are confused with that oh, i'm craving no you don't you have a, what's called a mental obsession you have that part or the tr2 on your tongue so the TR2 is a little uh, transmitter thing that tracks drugs and loves, uh, sorry, sugar and loves sugar and it'll get it and stuff like that. So the brain is like a mini uh, dictator. The brain gets what the brain wants every single time. So if it wants calcium, it'll strip the bones. If it wants sugar, it'll set that TR2 uh, receptor off at the back of the tongue and you'll get sugar. So you've got to take all that into consideration. But I, I would say, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. That's, I'm going to research that. I don't, I don't research anything, James. And the reason why I don't is because we're so deep into our testings and trials and beliefs of what we do. Uh, we don't want to get infected by anybody else, you know, out there that's telling you that 
you know, alcoholism is just alcohol and we've done this and we tried that. It, it, it goes way beyond that. Let me tell you a story. I'm outside a liquor store once at 5.30 in the morning in Manchester, England. I'm homeless. I have a vest on, a pair of shorts and a pair of flip-flops. It is pouring with uh, snow and it's like six below and I'm sweating profusely. I'm shaking. I can't put a, a sentence together. And I know in the next 30 minutes, if I don't get alcohol or get to hospital, I'm probably going to die. I already died twice on the street. Still didn't stop me drinking. Um, so the shopkeeper lets me in. He knows I'm an alcoholic. God bless that Pakistani guy. He let me in. He closes the door quickly on this one occasion, James. I had my 10 pounds in my hands. Oh, God, I can't really use it talk and I struggled over to the counter and I put my 10 pound on the counter and he put the bottle of vodka on the counter and for whatever reason I believe in God but for whatever reason this is what happened to me headache stopped shivers stopped sweating stopped mood changed into the happiest mood I've ever been in weeks because I held the bottle not even opened it by the way I held it and it was right there I realized that everybody who knows anything about alcoholism is wrong they mash it with drug addiction it's wrong it's not it's not how it goes down guys and that's the problem I find today is people are relapsing, relapsing, relapsing because they're concentrating. If I can just put the alcohol away and not touch it, and it's like, no, no, it doesn't work like that, guys. So I, I piss a lot of people off when, when I do uh, conferences. And at the end of the conference, they kind of go, oh, maybe he's got a point. Oh, my goodness. So we're trying to change the whole thing on alcoholism uh, and addiction. Addiction is uh, addictive personality. You know, mm. if you're taking drugs and you shouldn't be, you know, stop. The, the hypothalamus is not telling you to, to take drugs. It's a cycle that you're in. When 90% of patients that come to me with a heroin addiction started in the doctor's office, you have to look at what addiction really is. Yes, that's a nice segue into what are your views on doctor culpability in terms of addiction? Uh, the context of the question is, it's my view based on what I've read and what I've seen and experienced anecdotally from clients sharing stories that doctors have a tendency to prescribe medication without being fully aware of their patients challenges. Um, and the, the inference there or the suggestion is, is that they are financially motivated because pharmaceutical companies are obviously incentivizing them to write prescriptions for their drugs. Now, this is not to generalize so much and, and criticize every single doctor, obviously, but what's been your experience or your view in terms of doctor culpability, in terms of writing prescriptions for opioids and for you know anti-addiction um, medication? Well, you can't, obviously, you just, you just said you can't brush everybody with the same tar brush, uh, <clears throat> but I, I, I'm not 70, 80%. Um, if I'm going to the, here's a question. If I'm going to the doctor and I'm depressed and I tell him I'm depressed uh, and he pulls out a prescription pad without asking about my diet, about my exercise, about how much sun I get, then we're in a bad state of affairs. 90% of doctors do that. Why? Because they're incented. We're not by cash most of the time, but by holidays and boats and houses and stuff like that. The pharmaceutical run this world. So the food industry gets you sick and the pharmaceutical companies get you. So what we have to look with doctors is um, you should be responsible for any addiction that starts. If you're not going back to through the three generations, that's where it lies with uh, alcoholism or drug abuse and you're writing a prescription, you know, it, that's bad news. Now, if you're writing a prescription for Suboxone, let's say, to get somebody off heroin, let's say, and you're prescribing that for more than six to 12 weeks, you should be stripped of your license. Suboxone is a taper. If you're on Suboxone for a year or two years, the brain doesn't know the difference between pharmaceutical drugs and street drugs. You're still using, just because the guy's got a white coat and they know nothing about addiction. I will never go to, my, to a doctor for my general health ever again, especially when it comes to addiction. They have no idea, no idea. And they're a lot. I teach doctors in the, in the thousands sometimes on conferences about addiction and alcoholism because they haven't got a clue. Now, when it comes to psychiatrists, I think their amount of time with a patient is three minutes. 
they've only got three minutes. They're not going to find out anything. They're going to write a prescription and get you out. I was on, and you can Google this, guys. I was on a live uh, show uh, with me, the Purdue High Sales Manager, and their attorney. And, and we filmed it in Dallas, Texas. And we got on and we talked and we did this. And I told him what was what. And we, you know, they kind of looked a bit shameful. The very next day, Purdue filed for bankruptcy. Now, I'm not saying it was just me and you had a bunch of other things happened, but we've got to start stopping these guys. We've got to hold them accountable. They don't know. And just because you go to the doctor and say, I'm going to put you on this, says, what? You need a second opinion. You need to know why he's putting you on that. Because like, let me ask you another question, guys. Have you ever, ever gone to the doctor? He's give you a prescription that you've taken that has cured your illness and you never have to take that medication again. Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah. What's amazing as well, I'm going to reference a former client of ours by the name of Evan Melcher, and uh, he's based in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's very happy for me to reference his name because he's been on the show a couple of times and has been a testimonial. He was on 10 years of antidepressants and also acid reflux medication. He came through our stop drinking program, which is called Project 90 and stop drinking alcohol. And he went back to his doctor and they did tests and everything. He got off those 10 years of medications just by stopping drinking. So he oh, stopped drinking, God, yeah. bang, got yeah. off it. And now he's absolutely flying. He's so happy. He's lost so much weight. He uh, sleeps well. He doesn't take any prescription drugs. He's happy. He came down to Columbia for one of our annual uh, AFL retreats. I met his wife, Jennifer. Uh, they are as happy as Larry. And all he did, the only change he made, I mean, I'm saying only because it was one thing, but it was a bit, you know, it's obviously it's a big thing for him. But mm. the big thing that he did and the only thing he did was just stop consuming attractively packaged poison, which is what we call alcohol. And all of these other health conditions that he yeah. had just dis disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. You would have seen That's something similar, I'd imagine, Dr. Rob. Yeah, I mean, it's first of all, it's a depressant. I think everyone knows that, but the damage it does to every single organ in the body that it touches is disgraceful. You know, I mean, you get a guy that's people come to me and you go, hey, you know, I've been on this medication for depression for like six years. My answer is, when do you think it's going to kick in? Because it hasn't kicked in yet. Well, I mean, how long are you going to do what? What, look, look at, let's, look, let's pull the medical dictionary of, of the USA out. Let's look at the root cause of depression, lack of serotonin. Why isn't anybody asking the question, why my freaking serotonin is low in the first place? Nope, we don't do that. Drinking is a poison. It's a depressant. It affects you in so many ways that you will never understand how damaging that is to the body. So, yeah, you take away alcohol, you've probably taken... 90% of your problems away as well. And we, and mm. but because it's socially accepted wherever we go, you know, it's like, you know, and, and then people question people who don't drink. James, I go into a bar often with friends. You go, do you want to drink? No, no, I'll just take orange juice. Orange juice? Yeah, I don't drink. You don't drink? Why? Nobody does that with cheeseburgers or, yeah, I just want a cheeseburger, but don't give me cheese on it. You don't want cheese on it? Why? Well, it's under so much pressure. It's like, who gives a crap why? I'm not drinking. I'm just, I want you make up any excuse you want, but it's so ex accessible. It's legal. And it's so part of our society. It's like, well, I'm leaving and going for a drink after work. I mean, it's, it's something has to change, but there's so much tax and so much money to be earned off alcohol and nobody's going to touch that. And even if it's dead, you wouldn't solve the problem. Alcohol is the only drug where you have to justify not consuming it. I love that. I mm. love that. My goodness, I need to write that down. We're going to put your name against it. That's beautiful, man. It's also preposterous in my view that we call it drugs and alcohol. Oh, he's addicted to drugs and alcohol. Oh, he's got a drug and alcohol problem. Oh, there's a real problem in this country with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Well, hang on a second. Alcohol is a drug. Mm -hmm. So why are we saying drugs and alcohol? It's just drugs which includes alcohol. Have you noticed that? they all, People always write drugs and alcohol, drugs yeah. and alcohol. Yeah, definitely. 
definitely it's crazy we need an under well we just we just need a better understanding of the world we just need me and you and the millions that are trying to get this over to keep going and keep going and keep going and of course it gets very lonely where we are and you'll know this james because you come against so much pushback on anything you're trying to tell people until they understand exactly what's going on and what they're consuming and how much they're drinking and why they're drinking. And it goes back to childhood trauma. And if you don't clear your childhood trauma up, which is the gateway drug, then you're never going to get well. And, and it's crazy. Well, I can't, my depression can't come from a few glasses of wine. Blah, blah, blah. Do you research for the guys that know, you know? Because, and here's the other thing as well the mind is so complex, okay? that you can literally program your mind first thing in the morning, the conscious mind, to go and have the best day you've ever had. You can program your mind to do that. And and people don't. So they go about the normal days and they go they go into all sorts of routines and patterns. Look, you've got to look for the patterns, guys. You know, you're in a pattern every single day. And if you don't think you are, you ever gone out a day out somewhere to the seaside with a bunch of guys or girls you go down there you have a few beers you act stupid you get back on the bus which seat do you sit in usually the seat you went there in there's the pattern but we don't see patterns so the definition of insanity is not what you think it is as far as we're concerned the definition of insanity is me not being able to see my own truth and i stick in this cycle of disaster you know and i think it's going to be okay because it's the norm it's we're chain breakers guys we have to break the chains and don't get dragged into all the noise because that's what they want you to do. They want you to be dragged into this noise and, 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 and live the way they want you to live. And, and again, going back to the food companies killing us and the pharmaceutical companies rule the world. And as long as we, we know that, we, we have an understanding. Lack of knowledge kills people. You said that it's very lonely. It can be lonely uh, being in the minority here. I would submit uh, that it's never been less lonely. And also I actually revel in, I wouldn't even, for me, loneliness doesn't fit. That's the word that doesn't fit for me, but I get that that would fit for others. Like there's yeah. that concern that if you break free from the tribe and the norm, that you will be isolated and alone. I get that. And that's a very real thing. Cause we go back to Dunbar's tribe, which is, you know, we used to be in tribes of 160 people. And if we got uh, kicked out of the tribe, it meant certain death, right? Because like the wolf would get you, the bear would get you, a rival tribe would get you, it was just death. And that shows up in 2024, we still have that reptilian brain fear mm. that if we do anything different than the norm, that it could mean death. Mm. The reality is as though the world has changed and we don't have a, be a, a, a tiger gonna kill us or a rival tribe that's gonna kill us. And if we get kicked out of one tribe or we choose to leave one tribe, we can just join another one. Mm. And there's plenty of them around. Trust me, the, w the world is so connected now. Um, the other thing I would also say to our listener, there is a cultural change that is taking place now. And never before have people been so interested in leading an alcohol-free life or having a better relationship with alcohol. Millennials have never drunk less. Mm. Um, alcohol-free alternatives have exploded um, on the market. Uh, people, I, I read a stat that said 65 percent of Americans want to either reduce or stop drinking. That number may even be higher. Um, so there is a sea change happening. And I also revel in the fact that I'm in the minority. Like I, yeah, I don't too. look at that as go, oh, you know, I'm I'm lonely, I'm isolated. Oh, I'm 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 going against the norm. I'm like, yes, mm. I get to go against the norm. So yeah. I just say that to encourage a listener if that is your concern. Try doing what I refer to as the flipper Rooney and just changing the mindset, which is, yes, I am a pioneer. I am at the forefront of cultural change here. And that might give you an empowering feeling as opposed to a fear based feeling. What's your view, Dr. Rob? I agree, man. I agree. You know, when I say lonely, I'm talking about them podcasters who start, they're not getting anywhere. They've got two followers. They're doing it for a year. They've got three followers. I talk about them guys, but that me and you guys, no, and of course not. We're pioneers. Uh, what I tell my guys to every morning when they wake up is um, the breath work. Okay, so we get the breath work in. Now we're all alert. We go in the bathroom. We stand in front of the mirror from six feet away. Don't get close up. You'll see all your blemishes. Because we think when we see our blemishes, that's how people see us out there. And when's the last time you went for a meeting and, hey, Johnny, good to see. Nobody does that. So stand six feet away and your blemishes will go say, I love you 10 times. Let's feed that subconscious brain. If 300 neural pathways die every day, what are you replacing them with? And then your teeth. 
let's change up some neural pathways, right hand for a week, left hand for a week, right hand for a week, left hand for a week. That's all you need to do it for a month. You're changing patterns. If you go to work one way and uh, go another way, if you get gas after, the, just change it. Anything that reroutes a pattern, self-sabotage neural pathway is good. And there are billions in the head, don't get me wrong, but the problem with the depression and alcoholism and all that stuff is there's more self-sabotaging neural pathways in the brain than there are good neural pathways. So it's about changing that and rerouting them and repatterning them and knowing quite well that we are pioneers. I, I never tell some one of my guys to go, you know, I want to I build a business. I go, no, 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 you don't. You want to build an empire. Stop the, anyone can have a business, a business card and a website, big freaking deal. Start an empire. I've done it from homelessness. I've done it twice from homelessness. You know, when my second marriage split up, I gave her everything and started again 10 years ago. You know, anything is possible that you think is possible. If you think you can do it, you're right. If you think you can't do it, you're right. Either way, you're right, you know. And, and quantum physics backs this up. Let's say, can you imagine a basketball court, guys, and imagine uh, 10 of you on that court. So there's 10 Rob Kellys on that court. I can see them now. I've never played basketball, but where would I want to be? I want to be over near the goal. So I get the ball, I bang it in the net, and the hero of the game is the question. How do I get there? Here's the answer. You walk over and you take that position. You don't beg for it. You don't crawl for it. You walk over and take it. You visualize it. Walk over and take it. And people don't think it's that e It really is that easy. If you have, if, if you're in a work and you, oh, God, it's Monday and, you know, uh, hump day and tea, get another job. If, if you're going on to, to fight in the wife or, or, or husband, get another wife or husband. Well, Dr. Robert, it really is nice. It really is that easy. Stop living in this limited belief and core belief that if you're a child of Trump, you'll never do this and you'll never amount to it. Says who? That's my answer and question to everybody. Well, you can't come over here and, and be on a program that has 18 million. Says who? You can't be the highest paid doctor in tech. Says who? Stop listening to the noise around you because you'll get dragged back into that cesspit of a world where people want. Nobody likes people like me and you, James. Nobody likes people that pulls away from the norm. Nobody likes it. I'm the same as you. I thrive in it. You should see what I have on today. I have like 90 stupid paint on my jeans. I wear stupid glasses. I drive an extortionately crazy. I don't care. I'm leading the way for other people. I'm 63. But inside my head, I'm 23. So, so stop putting the brakes on your imagination, guys. I've just lost 157 pounds over the last 18 months. I'm living that dream instead of dreaming that living. And, and you need to know this, guys, and stop, stop sitting in that pattern and sitting in the, oh, my homelessness where I lost my children was the worst thing at the time that could ever happen. The way they took them off me when the last thing my three-year-old daughter says was, daddy, daddy, please stop drinking when that ripped my freaking heart out. If I can recover from that, so can you. But looking back now, people come in and go, Dr. Rob, you don't understand, man. My children just been taken, check. You don't understand it, check. Yep, check. So now it becomes my greatest asset. And I always say my homelessness and what I went through is like a semester at Harvard University. Because four years ago, I got my eldest child back. And six weeks ago, my youngest child, after 30 years, got in contact with me. My eldest child now works for me as a therapist in my, as my lead therapist in my Manchester office. Everything is possible. Stop putting that breaks and limited belief because you'll sit there and do you know what, guys? We don't have time. Everyone thinks they got time. We don't have time. Mom's waving the kids off to kindergarten. Next minute, I'm waving them off to, we don't have time. So buy that house, get that job, start that empire, date that girl, but do it today. Boom, baby. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> well said, Dr. Rob. You've clearly made your mess your message. So well played, sir. Uh, where can our listeners find more about you, Dr. Rob? Well, if you're listening, I spell my name with two Bs. R-O-B-B-K-E-L-L-Y.com is the website. Um, Dr. Rob Kelly in any search engine will come up. Uh, I never sell my services here or anything like that, but there's a great book out there if you find it. Don't buy it off Amazon. Send me a message. I'll sign it. I'll ship it free of charge and you can have it free of charge. 
on one condition. You pass it on to somebody else that may benefit after you've read it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rob. I appreciate you sharing your guidance and expertise with us and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, James.